I think the inflation we've had to date is in a way neither here nor there. What's more important is that there's a great deal of, of inflation or a great deal of financial repression in the system, and that's likely to be with us for, for some time to come. Welcome to another Breakout with Breaking Views, brought to you by PGIM. I'm Rob Cox, the editor of Breaking Views, coming to you from New York, and I'm speaking with Edward Chancellor in the British countryside. Eddie, great to see you after a bit of a break. I, I know you spent much of August thinking, like all of us, about financial repression. Um, what, why don't we step back for a second? Tell us a little bit of what that actually means. What does the term mean historically? And, and then let's get to why it matters today. So financial repression is the term used by economists for when, in, when interest rates are kept below the level of economic growth. That might seem like a fairly harmless thing, but the, the aim of financial repression, the aim of such policy is to inflate away um, an excessive debt burden. It, it, was, uh, it was practiced by, uh, by the American government, by European governments, after the Second World War, when in the United States, immediately after the war, um, you know, uh, the Fed, Fed funds rate was kept at around at below 1%, and the Treasury yield was capped at, at, at just over 2%. And over the following decades, uh, inflation always remained higher than bond yields. And they, the, as a result, the government debt, uh, the wartime debts were mostly paid paid off by, uh, by, the, by this policy of financial repression. So you're essentially melting away debt because growth is going higher. Now the repression occurs to those who own the fixed in income securities. Exactly, to the, to the bondholders. Now that's after World War II, huge debts were racked up by uh, governments. We've now come full circle in a sense. We've had the great financial crisis, 2008. There was a huge attempt to uh, by governments to uh, borrow to get through that crisis. Did that work in the first instance? Well, I would say that the government sort of instituted financial repression after the global financial crisis, you know, when the Fed first took interest rates down to zero. Um, but the trouble is that inflation, uh, the vital ingredient for financial repression, remained a bit sticky. And it re remained sticky for the sort of rather technical reason that the that when the Fed created all this the, the new money at the time with quantitative easing, it mostly stayed within the banking system and didn't get let lent out. And so what happened over the last in the post Lehman years, as you know, is that the U.S. government took on more debt and uh, corp U.S. corporations took on a great deal more debt, and that process accelerated during the pandemic. So the result is that at the end of last year, U.S a non-financial debt was roughly three times GDP, so a higher level than had ever been seen before in history. So that necessitates, to my mind, an, another attempt at financial repression. And I think this time around, they're going to be a lot more successful. Well, because we're seeing inflation. We're seeing uh, consumer prices and things like that going at a higher rate than had been expected. Yes, but it's, know, 4%, it's, things not, like it's that. not just that. It's that, as I said, that after the financial crisis, the QE was sort of trapped in Wall Street, whereas this time round, a lot of the, the central, you know, the, the central bank, what, uh, you know, expand, the Fed expanded its balance sheet by $4 trillion, and a great deal of that money went straight to Main Street, and now that money is actually sitting, a lot of it is actually sitting in US bank accounts, waiting to be lent. So it's not so much, I, do, I think the inflation we've had to date is, is, is in a way neither here nor there. What, what, what's more important is that there's a great deal of, of inflation or a great deal of financial repression in the system, and that's likely to be with us for, for some time to come. So is there, I mean, is this a free lunch? I mean, is this, is this uh, something, it worked after the war effectively. Um, is this something that, uh, are we gonna be okay? Or is there some sort of difference between let's say now and then that would give you greater concern? Well, there's no such thing as a free lunch as Milton Friedman said. And, and obviously we've already mentioned uh, the costs, uh, the first costs, the heaviest costs, are borne by uh, the owners, uh, by 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 bondholders. And uh, for instance, you know, after the Second World War, 
the owner in the decade after the Second World War, the owners of, uh, of, of British guilds lost 40% of their purchasing power in one year. And that was only the half of it. By the mid 70s, if you owned a, 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 an undated console, you'd lost something like 97% of its purchasing power since 45. So, so yes, first of all, the bondholders are, are in, are, are, you know, are, are first in line. I think that although equity investors are not so, um, directly affected by financial oppression because they own real assets. Uh, the trouble is today, the, the, the low value, that very high valuations on the stock market are posited on these very low bond yields. So, and it's no coincidence that, that, the, that, the, that the long bear market in bonds started in 1946, right at the beginning of financial oppression. So if we are at the beginning of a long uh, bond bear market, which I think we probably are, uh, then equities will do badly. So, the, so outperformance against that backdrop of fixed income and equity, where would you want to find it? Well, I mean, I, I cite in my piece uh, the investment strategist Russell Napier. He argues that you 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 should that, that investors should replace the fixed income uh, securities in their portfolio with gold, which is is quite a bold move. But but Russell argues that that actually gold tends to do well. When, uh, when interest rates are kept below the, the level of inflation. I think there are equities that will do well. Russell, for instance, when I was speaking to him, was touting Japanese equities, which, would, which are relatively cheaper than US equities and stand to benefit um, more from the shift to inflation. So I'm, I'm not saying that equities everywhere are in trouble. There are some other things to think about, because if financial repression is going to be effective, uh, the government start, must start um, directing capital, uh, more capital, more savings themselves. And I think, and, and this is the point that Russell makes, is that um, when they start directing, they will start directing capital in, in, regu in regulated financial institutions like insurance companies or, or, or pension funds. And they'll start taking that money and start using it for their preferred end, you know, green energy investment or whatever. And the, and the problem is that when the government starts managing your savings, for you, the returns from investments are going to be poor. So that's one problem. There's another issue, um, which I think is quite interesting, is, as you know, the last decade, um, or you know, last 25 years, we've had endless financial engineering you know, by leverage buyouts and uh, share buybacks. Now, if, if financial oppression is, is going to work, they're going to have to bring financial engineering to an end. So that's bad news for Steve Schwartzman and the people at, at, at Blackstones, but the, I think that that's going to have to happen. That will either happen through regulation of some sort of mandating debt for equity swaps or through, say, uh, as I suggest, a, a reform in the tax system to get rid of the tax deductibility for corporate interest payments. So there are all these, these other things to think about. And the last thing to think about is that after the Second World War, financial repression worked because of capital controls. The Bretton Woods International Monetary System mandated capital controls. And that meant that savings were kept in the countries uh, where, where they originated. And that meant that it was easier to financially repress them. So at some stage in the future, if this financial repression is to continue, we face the prospect of capital controls. And that would be, as you can imagine, a, a, might, a mighty headache. All right. Well. Eddie, thank you for that. We'll end on that cheery note on repression, but uh, thanks. And uh, we'll be back with another breakout from Breaking Views soon.